So if suddenly in a conversation you find yourself umming and aahing nonstop, take a second to check in with your brain. What's your brain doing? Is it nervous? Is it spinning out of control? Is it that you've lost your train of thought? What's your body doing? Is your heart pounding? Are you starting to feel really jittery? Those physical and mental clues that they tend to happen just a second or two before all of the filler words come out. So if you can learn to recognize that, oh no, my brain is spinning. Now you can go into the, I'm going to watch for those filler words mode. You can focus on tamping them down, on closing your mouth instead of letting them come out. So I use those physical cues as kind of an early warning sign. Filler words, Lauren. Uh, and this is a big concern for many of my clients because uh, like they are afraid that they are not going to sound professional because they use a lot of ums and ahs. Uh, and as we already mentioned, or you already mentioned, these are just part of natural speech. Okay. Uh, I, I have a background in linguistics, so I learned that the brain naturally filters out those sounds that are not conveying any information, like you filter them out, like they happen all the time. And when you're having a conversation, you're not listening to the ums and ass. You're perceiving the message because the, the brain just filters out everything else, not even the ums and ass, but like the surrounding noise, the traffic noise, birds, other people talking, etc. Like that thing is blocked and you only focus on the message. But I, I understand like people still get a, a, like very, very concerned about this. Filler words are natural and they are like they have meanings and functions in language. And th mm -hmm. that's something like a lot of people don't know. Like they are used for different like they they have a place in communication. So wh why don't you tell us a little bit in general terms what filler words are and like some examples? Uh, when you said that your linguistics background, I got very nerdy. Like, yes, um, I, did, I don't have a full linguistics background, but I did take several linguistics courses and we called them non-meaningful verbal utterances. Mm -hmm. How's that for a big old mouthful of words? And it is <laughs> the way that one of my profs taught us is that it's, it's your brain's way of making your mouth stop talking mm -hmm. so it can take half a second to think about what it wants to say. So that was that I've always found very, very useful. It's literally a pause in speech yeah. so you can find the next word. That's what they are. Now, they're very similar to what I also call crutch words, which are things like so or people say and every five seconds as a, as a way of trying to bridge the gap in their words. Yes, one can overcome them. Yes, they are absolutely a natural part of language, but the I interpret them as being problematic when other people are telling you that you do it too often. Yes. When it's so often that it's now affecting other people, you frequently hear this. Um, I'm Canadian and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his and his father before him, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, are infamous for this. Absolutely infamous for ums and ahs. And it does become distracting after a while. They use them so frequently. Barack mm -hmm. Obama is frequently criticized for this as well. So if other people are saying, you gotta pull back, then you have an issue. And the other marker is that if you're doing them so often that it's a point of deep anxiety for you, if, if yeah. those things are making you nervous, then you want to deal with it. If it's just like, oh, it'd be nice to be polished. Eh, don't worry about them. With the ums and ahs, and this is uh, this is something that I learned in in years of uh, of acting training. Because it's your brain's way of trying to find the word. Pause and let your brain find the word mm -hmm. as soon as you feel that um or that ah or whatever your filler word is. It might be a hmm, whatever it is. As soon as you feel your mouth start to make the shape and it's like your throat starts to make the sound, you close your mouth. Mm -hmm. And you take a breath in through the nose. So it might be something like, you know, uh, David, I'm really, really curious about your, your setup there. I see that you've got a pretty advanced mic. Mm -hmm. What is that mic? What might it do? So I, I started to, uh, and then close the mouth, take the breath in through the nose. That gives you that silence where you can think it gives you that pause. It gives you the breath to get the brain flow, uh, to get the blood flowing to your brain again. And from the audience's perspective, it can actually sound very wise and thoughtful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was one of those great 
great secrets when you yes, can yes, be yes, silent yes. for a minute to think about that next word. The audience often just leans in even more. Like, ooh. Yeah. They Silence know. is important as well. Yeah, so and, important. Now that you touch on that, there is another another uh, issue that, oh, like, another part that a lot of my clients are concerned about is, oh, there were a lot of silences, a lot of silences and a lot of dead spaces. Oh. But silence has meaning. Yes. Silence has meaning as well. Oh, God, I love you. <laughs> We've got we've got something going on here, David. It does. Silence has meaning. I like to say that silence modifies a message. Yes. It does so many things. It can it the weight of that silence can create implications. It gives the audience time to think and understand, to actively think about what it is you're saying. So yes. it gives them a minute to catch up with you, which is really important, especially if you don't want your audience to feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Silence is an important part of that. It brings cadence and rhythm into our speech. It makes it more interesting to listen to. And if you use it well, it can create tension. Mm -hmm. So you you stop, you, you say something that you want to be enormously witty. And then you pause right before you deliver the really witty thing. And then you say that punchline or that joke or whatever, yeah. or that profound statement. Yes. During the pause, the tension in the audience is building up. And then it's broken when you say the when you say the big payoff sentence or the big payoff word. And that is very satisfying to an audience. It's one, it's actually a critical, critical part of stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. You build the tension and then you break the tension, you deliver the payoff. And the great thing is, is that in those moments of silence, you can be doing things like breathing because you feel yourself starting to freak out or thinking because you've lost your train of thought or pausing because now you're using too many filler words and you want to kind of suppress one. But the audience interprets it very differently. Yes, absolutely. I, I work with uh, health and wellness coaches uh, and what like sometimes in their interviews, they have to ask difficult questions because like they have to talk about trauma or like these, these life experiences. And it's different if the person, like if the host asks the questions and there is there is a five second silence. That means there is a tension that there is a struggle on the guest side to be able to answer that. Mm -hmm. And that's meaningful. Yeah. If I get to cut that silence and make it one second, a lot of that emotional thing is going to be lost. Yeah. Um, that, that display, that demonstration that you're actively thinking Mm -hmm. or that you're struggling to find the right words. Like you yes. said, it's deeply meaningful. It yes. increases the connection with the audience. It's actually a rhetorical technique that's mm -hmm. like codified in Roman rhetoric. I'm a bit of a rhetoric geek. In mm -hmm. Roman rhetoric, that display, that demonstration that you're thinking, that you're wrestling with something to say, that's something that they would practice doing because the impact on the audience is so powerful. So don't be afraid if you're asked a tough question in an interview yeah. or if you're asking a tough question, do not be afraid to let that silence hang. Just let it be there. Yeah, that sounds great. That's, I, I think this is something, this episode is something I'm going to share with all of my clients as soon as we finish recording and we publish it <laughs> because it's critical. Yeah, you won't believe how many times people are concerned about these issues that are actually on the one side natural and the uh, on the other side meaningful to the conversation. Like they, that yeah. make, makes part of what is being conveyed. And we have like these, um, like the verbal communication and the nonverbal communication. I think this is probably part of the nonverbal communication that also adds to, to, to the, to the um, whole interaction, particularly in podcasting, which is a format where you don't have that visual cue of, of what's going on. That's very true. Without the visual cues in podcasting, you know, people worry about those silences, about the dead air. God mm -hmm. forbid there be dead air. That was yeah. something when I was in radio, that was something that we worked against all the yes. time. But here's a great example. Of course, the, the, the goddess of all interviewers. If you watch Oprah Winfrey when interview someone, mm -hmm. the frequency with which she lets that silence hang there is incredible. And you can turn the visual off. You can close your eyes and just listen to it. And it is equally effective in audio only 
as it mm-hmm. is audio video. Absolutely. Lauren, going back to the filler words and crotch words uh, that can be overused at a point that they become problematic and interrupt the flow of the idea, what are some exercises or strategies people can implement in their everyday lives to start reducing this? Because like, as, as you mentioned, one, like they, are, they can be originated, originated for several reasons, by several reasons. Anxiety can be one of them, nervousness, or just like the habit of using them. So what could people do in order to start reducing them? I'm a big fan of practicing these techniques as frequently as you possibly can. So to mm-hmm. me, every conversation, every interaction, whether you're in front of the podcasting microphone or at the grocery store or with your family, those are all opportunities to practice and you should be taking them frequently because if you can mm-hmm. if you can practice this sort of stuff and I will give you specific examples if you can practice them regularly throughout the day in just little little drips and drabs yeah it becomes habitual so it's easier then to implement when you're actually performing when you're on microphone when you're on camera or whatever mm-hmm. first thing is I want people to start recognizing when they are most prone to using a lot of filler words So if suddenly in a conversation you find yourself umming and aahing nonstop, take a second to check in with your brain. What's your brain doing? Is it nervous? Is it spinning out of control? Is it that you've lost your train of thought? What's your body doing? Is your heart pounding? Are you starting to feel really jittery? Those physical and mental clues that they tend to happen just a second or two before all of the filler words come out. So if you can learn to recognize that, oh no, my brain is spinning. Now you can go into the, I'm going to watch for those filler words mode. You can focus on tamping them down, on closing your mouth instead of letting them come out. So I use those physical cues as kind of an early warning sign. Mm -hmm. The next thing is that that's technique that I learned um, in film acting. And that was when you feel it start, you close your mouth. So this takes a lot of self-awareness. This is why it takes regular practice. As soon as you recognize the vibration in your throat, you close your mouth, take a breath, and then speak again. Mm-hmm. And I want again, I want you to be doing this many times throughout the day. Uh, those two in combination really, really help. Third thing that you can practice is simply slowing down how quickly you speak. Yeah. Yeah. Because, of course, when we are nervous our mouth speeds up as well. And then the mouth is running faster than the brain can run. If you can slow down your mouth, then you're going to be able to control that a lot more easily. Now, how slow should you go? That's going to depend on what language it is you're speaking in. English Mm -hmm. and Germanic languages are very slow languages. So I would not want to be speaking any faster than I'm speaking right now. If you're, uh, what, what's your first language, David? Spanish. Super fast. Super fast. <laughs> yeah. Super fast. So what is slow to a Spanish speaker is not going to be as slow to an English speaker. So yes. slow down for you, for your language. The way that I put this to my public speaking students is to go twice as slow as you think you should and then slow down again. Okay. <laughs> it's very scientific, right? Very, very scientific. Um, it's, it will feel really awkward at first, but you'll get used to it. A way to help yourself slow down is to overpronounce things ever so slightly. So just overpronounce each word, even if you're speaking in your first language, ever so slightly, because that's going to, that forces you to slow down mm-hmm. just a little bit. Yeah. One of the exercises I do for that is literally to get people to bite a wine cork <laughs> in between their teeth. You... You bite on, I don't have my cork. I do have my cork. You do Look have one. That. Okay. You have it. So for everyone who is listening, I have a wine cork in front of me and I'm going to put it in between my front teeth, uh, about two centimeters, uh, maybe like one centimeter in like this. And then you speak around the cork. Okay. It is really hard to do, but it forces you to enunciate more clearly and slow down. So then when you take it out, you can feel every muscle in your mouth and you try to keep that slow, clear enunciation. 
that slowing is going to help you get control of your filler words. It helps so much. So if you find it hard to slow down, literally put a cork in it, stick a cork mm -hmm. between your teeth and talk around it. And then you'll develop that, that skill of doing that. One more thing that I want people to watch out for, for filler words is so and and. Mm -hmm. Those two words we tend to use instead of periods at the end of sentences, instead of a full stop at the end of a sentence. So if you find yourself saying so a lot or and a lot, I want you to focus on the sentence that you're saying in your head, visualize it really, really clearly and picture the period at the end, picture that full stop dot. Then you're going to drive all of your focus and all of your attention towards that full stop. When you hit it, hit it hard and pause. And then say your next sentence. That will help you mentally slow down again and will help filter out some of those filler words that we use instead of a proper transition. All of this takes practice. Oh my God. Yes, 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 absolutely. Like if you did do this once, it's not going to give you <laughs> it's any not results. Gonna work. It's something you have to do constantly. I don't know, practice yeah. before an interview or like, I don't know, a few times a day or a few days a week. Whenever but, it occurs to you. Yeah. Whenever yeah, yeah, it yeah. occurs to you and try different techniques. Try the cork. Try just thinking slow down twice as much, then slow down again. Um, try the the pause and the breathe. Try out a bunch of different things until you find what works for you mm -hmm. and then practice it one minute here, one minute there, many times throughout the day mm -hmm. and you'll get a hang of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like where you, while you were speaking, I was like taking a lot of notes here. So I would like to go back to some of the I, like, topics you mentioned. Uh, slowing down, uh, it's it has been very effective for me because I try to rush even in my in my native language i try to rush a lot and i've noticed that slowing down helps me speak better because i have more time to think about what i'm going to say or if i don't find the right word i can find a different word or different expression so it gives me more time and it helps me be clear in my speech yep so that's helped a lot and, and, and I, i didn't know why people would uh speed up when speaking when they were nervous and it's because a lot of times they fear they are going to lose the other person's attention if they don't give all the information quickly. Uh, or, or maybe they feel that what they have to offer in terms of information is not valuable enough. So when, when you slow down, it, like, it helps you reassure what you are conveying is important and is valuable to the other, other person. And like the, you're going to have their attention there. Yep. Uh, over pronouncing, I have to do that all the time <laughs> <laughs> because because English is not my native um, is not my native uh, language. It's not it's not even a second language; it's a foreign language. Like every if we go out, everybody's going to be speaking Spanish. Um, so I do need to over pronounce that, and it it helps. It it believe me, it helps. It it helps me slow down as well. And, and enunciation exercises, I haven't done that, but I'm going to get a cork. Okay, <laughs> uh, that's gonna be a good excuse to buy a good couple bottles of wine. Exactly, <laughs> and it sometimes helps if you drink the wine first because wow, using the cork, you're gonna feel like a complete twit while you're doing it. I spent many years, many years with uh, with acting stuff with a with a cork jammed in between my teeth, just developing that skill. It's it, this is actually something that's used in speech language pathology as well. Oh my, in order okay. to in order to overcome um, some speech difficulties, so it's it's not well. It's weird, but it's not unheard of. <laughs> That sounds good. That sounds good. Okay, caution here to those listening: please do not get drunk before recording. Okay, it's just for the <laughs> yes. cork. That's for just the cork. Just the cork. Just okay. the cork. All right. So I know what I'm going to do after recording is just go get a couple of bottles of wine, red wine. <laughs> Uh, and, and the other thing I do, Lauren, is uh, I do some warm-up exercises. They look really silly and they sound really silly, but they have proven to be very effective so I can speak more freely uh, in my interviews. I do like uh, the... <laughs> all that, yep. like tone up, tone down, uh, <laughs> tongue twister, the Peter Piper picked a pack of pickled papers, all these things, massage my face to help my, my muscles, my face muscles relax. And, and when I start speaking after doing this, I do feel it's a lot easier for me just to flow with the conversation. Yep. 
everything's warmed up. It's all limbered up and ready to go. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think that's that's something uh, singers do. I don't like probably public speakers do as well, and uh, stand up comedians do a lot. Yeah. And that's something we should all do before recording or before having an, an interview online. Yes, um, it also helps reduce vocal fatigue and uh, vocal cord damage. I've been doing mm -hmm. a lot of looking into this lately because with uh, not not being able to be on stage at all, I'm used to a pretty 50-50 mix of live audiences and sitting and recording at home. I had gotten out of the practice of doing those kinds of warm-ups and of just practicing good vocal cord hygiene. So mm -hmm. you can hear it when I'm, when I get tired, my voice gets really gravelly. Oh yeah. That happens with a lot of people, but it was starting to get painful. So looking into those, uh, those singer warm-up exercises work really well. I've been doing a lot of speaking and vocalizing into straws because that helps mm -hmm. you, that helps you bring the sound where it needs to be in the front of your face yeah. instead of trying to force your vocal cords. I've been working on a little bit of vocal rehab there myself. So this is this is ongoing practice that we do throughout our speaking careers, throughout our recording careers. Yes, it's like yes, yoga. Yes. It's a practice. It's a practice. So before I, I move on to the next question, I will also like also like to add hydration. It's very important. Hydration. Water. Water. I always have a cup of water next to me. So that does help a lot. Like to keep your your throat clear when you're talking. Uh, Lauren, so moving from the arms and ass and all this, there is also the situation where we know what we want to say. Okay, we we uh, we were asked a question. We know what we want to say, but we just can't find the words or we can't remember the right term or, ex or expression to do it. We get stuck or we <laughs> fear that we are going to run out of things to say. So... How can you work around this? Like you just go blank, you forget the word, forget the expression, forget the answer. How can you manage that? If you're an interviewee and you and you get really stuck, you go absolutely blank. Ask the interviewer to rephrase the question. Mm -hmm. It's always acceptable to do that. Like you do yeah. have a little bit of control as the interviewee here, which is really wonderful. So you can say something like, um, You know, could you, sorry, David, could you say, could you ask me that question again? I kind of went blank there. Admit it. Be honest. We all go blank time to time. But I really like saying, uh, what made you think of that question? What situation do you have in mind that's prompted that question? Mm -hmm. And then that gives them a time to basically prompt you for the sort of thing that they're looking for you to say. So it'll give you a hint as to what to say. Um, asking for examples, asking them to phrase it differently, that's all very, very effective. From a response standpoint, if you need to say something and you can't think of the right words, first up, admit that you're struggling to find the words because again, that's a human experience. Yeah, It's going to make you seem more authentic and more relatable to the audience. But it also mentally gives yourself permission to struggle with it so that you're not thinking, oh, I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I forgot what I wanted to say. Just put it out there. You know, I'm struggling to find the words right now. It's something kind of like this. And then use an analogy. Say what it's like. And if you can't think of the exact thing that you wanted, talk about something that's really similar to it or that's adjacent to it. And often mm -hmm. I find that when you come in with those spontaneous analogies, by the end of your analogy or by the end of the story, you've got the words mm -hmm. and you can summarize it and then get that thought out. So it took you a little while to get there. As you would say in comedy, that was a long walk to that final answer, but you'll have gotten there. <laughs> 